All right, in this video, we're gonna focus on, in this particular pathophysiology topic, we're gonna to focus on the clinical aspects of cancer, or you know, basically just talking about what cancer is, um, how it develops, and, uh, some, and a lot of terminology that's related to this. And then from here, we're gonna talk about clinical signs of cancer. So basically, with this video, I'm gonna focus more on the first three bullet points, because probably by the time I'm done with these three, there won't be a lot of time left. I'll have loaded you with quite a bit of information. And so I'm going to save uh, the clinical signs of cancer and um, risk factors for the follow-up video to this. So like I said, for so we're going to focus on, um, have a heavy uh, review on or, or introduction into terminology. And in the process of that, I'll cover what cell differentiation is. And by this point in time, you know what differentiation is anyway. Remember, whenever you see that term, differentiate, um, you know, if you've learned this term from me, you've always heard me say, think of this as specialization. Now that's important because you have to look at the cellular makeup of, of tumors and figure out how specialized or different or weird they are. And we'll talk more about that. And then it's very important to understand the differences between malig uh, benign and malignant tumors and uh, how they behave. And uh, obviously, di diagnostically, this is important. And then we'll end the presentation by looking at some visual examples of, um, of benign versus malignant tumors. All right. So let's... Uh, introduce this first. So when learning about cancer, I mean, you're learning about the number one killer of human beings on the planet. I mean, nothing kills more people than cancer. I mean, you know, there, I mean, as you know, there's lots of infections out there. There's lots of accidents, you know, I mean, you know, humans kill each other all the time. Animals, other animals kill us. But in the end, um, like I said, cancer, is, is the number one killer of people. And, you know, a big reason for that is just because, yeah, you know, one thing you have to understand is that when you think about, you know, cancer, tumor development, I mean, a big part of, of, of this is mitosis, all right? And what I like to call mitosis gone wrong, Okay, mitosis gone wrong because in many instances, cancer is as inevitable as the process of mitosis itself. You know that our that that many cells of our body are mitotically active, dividing all the time, and um, and the more cells are dividing, replicating themselves, making genetic copies of themselves, the higher the chance of, you know that errors can occur that can cause tumors to develop. And then if we expose ourselves to hazardous environments, all right, that really uh, you know, wreak havoc or or hinder that cell cycle, we further increase the chance of, of developing tumors or cancers and so on. All right, so that's something you have to bear in mind is that cancer is a very prominent part of life. That's why it, it does take so many people. As uh, you know, as 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 hard as that is to say and as bad as it is to talk about, that's just one of the unfortunate facts of life. All right. And um, basically, the first the first thing you have to understand is this term neoplasm. All right. So basically, when you're thinking of the term neoplasm, um, basically you know that neo. All right. Neo means new. All right. And when you think of plasm, think of tissue growth. All right. When you think of when you see that term plasm, think tissue growth. So what we're literally saying here um, is a neoplasm is a new tissue growth. All right. And that is basically what a tumor is, all right? A tumor is a mass of tissue that has developed or originated in another organ, all right? So, I mean, and 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 these can occur potentially anywhere in the body, all right? Uh, you know, in the brain, in the liver, in the lungs, in the stomach, in the intestines, all right, in connective tissue spaces of the body, within lymph nodes, all right? Anywhere where a tumor develops, that is a neoplasm, right? It's a new tissue growth, all right? And these new tissue growths can either be benign or they can be malignant, all right? A, a neoplasm or a tumor that is benign, that's typically a little bit better of a word to see because um, that because basically when you say a, a, a tumor is benign, you're basically saying that it's slow growing, that it's, uh, it's cellular makeup is, is very original or as close to the, you know, where um, the tissue it originated from. And the, and the suffix oma, all right, is a term, is, is basically used when you're describing benign tumors. So for example, if someone develops an adenoma, 
all right, an adenoma is um, is basically, remember what adeno means? Remember, medical terminology 101. All right, an adenoma, you know, ad, you know, adeno means gland. Okay, so basically if someone has an, if someone is diagnosed with an adenoma, what you're saying is, is they've got a benign tumor in a particular gland. And obviously the, the, the terminology is going to be a lot more specific than that, but you get the picture. All right, so, um, or someone can develop a lipoma, all right, um, just a mass of fat. All right, a bunch of fat cells that are, you know, growing a little out of control. All right, so, and, and, and in saying that, like, for example, lipomas are not typically that harmful. Not every tumor that a person develops is going to be horribly life-threatening, is going to mean the end of the world. In many cases, these, you know, the, these benign masses can be relatively easily removed. And in many cases, they can't. All right, and we'll talk more about that in a little bit. Now, um, now when we think of the term cancer, now, cancer obviously is a very important clinical term, and but cancer is a word that I think is thrown all, thrown around just a, a little too liberally out there, um, or loosely, or however you want to say it. Um, but basically, cancer is a word that's used to describe malignant neoplasms or malignant tumors. All right. Now, when we and and then that's where carcino comes in. All right. You know, basically, we're saying that that if if we if you see that word carcino in a in a term or on, on someone's chart um, or in a book or wherever you see it, what we're saying here is that that neoplasm or that tumor is cancerous. So if someone has an adeno carcinoma. All right. So basically, remember adeno gland, oma tumor, and carcino cancerous. So what we're saying here is that um, you know malignant tumors. Cancerous tumors, that's a that's a diagnosis you don't want to receive. All right, because these are the tumors that grow out of control. These are the ones that are invasive, that spread into and through other tissues. These are the ones that cause a lot of damage. All right. Um, and obviously the later you catch these malignant neoplasms, these cancerous neoplasms, obviously the lower the chances of survival. That's why for certain, you know, there, you, there are certain uh, screenings that can be done. You know, we do a lot of self checks on ourselves. There are certain, um, you know, uh, at certain ages you start getting tested for um, certain things, you know, like mammograms, prostate checks, you know, males and females doing their own self checks and so on. All right. Now these malignant tumors, these are the ones that are capable of metastasizing. And basically metastasis, this is a, it's an easy term to understand. Basically what we're saying here is we're saying that this malignant tumor or this malignant neoplasm is spreading. All right, spreading. And I'm going to talk more about how they spread in a little bit, but basically for now, that's what you have to understand. Whenever you see the word metastasis or metastasize, all right, we're saying, you know, that that's not a word that's used to describe a benign tumor, all right? That is a, that, you know, metastasis is used specifically for uh, malignant tumors, all right? Now, you're probably wondering, well, how do you tell if a tumor is malignant or benign? All right, how do you tell if it's if it's a malignant or benign? And a big part of that is, well, it, you know, the diagnostic process of this is first off, a patient's gonna there. There are typically I'm not gonna talk about these in depth in this video or really much at all, but there there are very common signs and symptoms that are that are typical to cancers, like uh, you know, people developing tumors like pain, bleeding, um, anemia. Uh, weakness, uh, loss of appetite, and so on. All right, and then basically, once you, as a as a practitioner, start putting those pieces of the puzzle together, and you start figuring out that okay, look, they've, um, they're, you know, they, 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 there's a good chance they may have a, a particular tumor or cancer developing somewhere. Then um, odds are you're probably going to have to do some scanning. All right, and then if you see the mass, you know, whether it's you know ultrasound, CT scans, whatever you have to do, depending on where you think the tumor is located, and so on. All right. Um, then if it's a, you know, obviously you can get to it, then you biopsy the tumor. Remember, biopsy is when you just, when you remove a, a, a sample of tissue from the patient and then you analyze it, you study it. All right. And then basically when you take a look at this, benign tumors are going to have cells that are highly differentiated, meaning they're going to look, they're going to look a lot like, they're going to look very specialized. They're going to look almost exactly like the, the, the tissue that the tumor originated in. Whereas a malignant tumor, the cells are going to look very bizarre, alien. They're, they're not going to look anything like the, like the original tumor that, um, that the, 
uh, you know, that, that the mass or the neoplasm is found in. And we'll, and we'll see some visual examples of that a little later on. All right. And then when you see this, you know, I have this term mesenchyme on here just because, um, you know, for example, there are some tumors that people can develop that are called sarcomas or a sarcoma. All right. So basically, what a what the mesenchyme is that's a, that's an embryologic uh, it's an embryology term that's typically used to describe more or less uh, embryologic connective tissue. Um, and there are obviously tissues of the body that develop from this. So, um, but uh, a lot of times, you you know, we would say that with sarcomas, that these meson that these that if someone has a sarcoma, that these are that these are tumors of a mesenchymal origin, like for example, an osteosarcoma. So typically with sarcomas, um, so sarc so when we say sarcoma, remember mesenchymals, you know, connective tissue origin, and then typically they're gonna you're gonna specifically see the word root or which tissue that this originated from because there's lots of tissues that um, you know develop from the mesenchyme, the embryo uh, embryonic mesenchyme. So. So an osteosarcoma would be a bone tumor, all right? Um, so that's something you have to keep in mind there. Um, and then I have these terms here, oncogene and tumor suppressor gene, all right? And I'm not going to spend a lot of time in this video getting into the genetics of cancer um, just because I, you know, I don't think as... Um, as undergraduate uh, pathophys students, because obviously that's who this class is targeted for. Um, you know, basically, you don't really need to dive a whole lot into depth with that. I mean, if you're, you know, in, going into immunobiology, you're in medical school, some graduate program, very upper level advanced cell biology, or cell biology or genetics, then you dive more into that. But for pathophys, I mean, you don't really need to get too in depth with the genetics of cancer. Um, but but basically, when you see this term oncogene, basically that's a gene that promotes the development of cancer. And then we have various genes um, in our cells called tumor suppressor genes that are designed to prevent cancer development. All right. Now, um, you, you remember how the cell cycle works. All right. You've basically got interphase, which, compose, which is comprised of your synthesis phase, gap one, gap two, and then mitosis. All right. So remember that if you're thinking of a cell that is... Um, you know, that's very, that, that's, um, you know, stable or labile. All right. Remember labile cells, they, they undergo my, this is supposed to be labile, pardon my handwriting people. Um, you know, remember labile cells, these are cells that have high rates of mitosis. Stable cells are typically capable of undergoing mitosis, but they don't unless they're forced to like liver cells, for example. So if someone has liver damage, um, whether it's via, you know, they remove a piece for transplant purposes or, um, alcoholism and infection, whatever it may be. And the, and then liver cells are damaged, then the cells will divide to replace the damaged cells. Whereas with, uh, you know, labile cells like epithelial tissues, all right, these are, these are tissues that are, that are very high turnover. All right. Um, and then you've got your permanent cells, which are cells that just don't divide like your neurons and your cardiac muscle cells. All right. But, um, but regardless, um, when you think of cells in the in the cell cycle here, remember that when a cell is you know stimulated to you know when it needs to divide, um, it's going to go through these gap you know these gap phases you know cellular growth. The S phase is going to replicate all this genetic makeup, and then the M phase is actual mitosis. Now, um, basically, before a cell passes from one phase to the next. Um, there are these, there are these what are called cellular checkpoints that just make sure everything's all right. I mean, if we're going to replicate all of our DNA in the in the synthesis phase, we don't want we want zero errors in that process. All right, if you know if a cell is damaged um, or if it lacks nutrition, I mean, it's not going to grow properly. All right, and we and basically, if we have cells with bad DNA or that are damaged. And we start making copies of them. You can do the math on how that could be bad news. That's basically how neoplasms develop. All right. So basically, what these what these tumor suppressor genes do um, is they essentially take the cell and they more or less what I like to say shut it down, put it in what's called the gap zero phase. All right. And basically, the cell is going to try to repair itself, and if it can't, it'll terminate itself. All right. 
Now, the reason, and, and if it's unable to do that and it continues to grow, then that's you know when a neoplasm comes in. Now, the reason why I say this, because in many cases when you do these biopsies and you, you, know, you run a, you know, you do a genetic test on the, on the, on these um, tumor cells, oftentimes these tumor suppressor genes are mutated. One of the most common ones, or probably the most common one that's talked about or that you see mutations in, in is a gene called the P53 gene. All right, but that's what tumor suppressor genes do, is, that, is if there's any problems in the cell cycle, they're designed to prevent these cells from developing and making bad copies of themselves, all right? And then risk factors, I'm going to talk about more in the follow-up video to this when we, you know, with clinical science, but basically risk factors increase the odds O D D S and again sorry for the handwriting they increase the odds of you developing a tumor now I'm gonna say this again they increase the odds I do not want you people going 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 out there walking around saying that risk factors guarantee cancer tumor development because that's not necessarily true in hundred percent of the cases alright just because a person smokes doesn't mean they're going to develop lung cancer, but you don't need to be a rocket scientist to know that that if a person does smoke and a lot throughout their life, that they increase the odds of developing lung cancer or other types of health problems. All right. Now the reason why I say this is just because in the the business and marketing side of medicine and and health, unfortunately, a lot of supplement sales and oddball professionals out there have kind of hijacked a lot of these concepts and terms related to this and put out products and say, oh, look, this, you know, this will cure cancer or reduce your odds of developing something or whatnot. And you have to remember that most of the, the majority of those supplements and products are based on anecdotal evidence at best because they're not, they're not heavily regulated by the FDA and so on or other agencies and it's easy to put uh, it's very easy to put a lot of those supplements out on the market all right so they'll say what they can to try to um, to try to get you to believe in their products the other side too is that a lot of times in education especially at younger ages we tend to use scare tactics to try to scare the scare the daylights out of people and kids into not doing things I don't think that's right either because it's really important to prevent that I'm sorry to present the facts and let people make decisions for themselves um, you know, cause, uh, you know, like for example, in, in school, you're always shown the infamous picture of the black lung, you know, from a chronic smoker. Yeah, that's not, I mean, we all know nowadays that, that, that smoking is not the best idea in the world. Uh, you know, does that kind of stop people from doing it? No, but you know, you inform people and, but, but we talk about, we say that, look, your lungs are going to look like this, you know, you're going to get lung cancer. I mean, you know, we scare the, we scare the crap out of people and that's not a good thing to do. All right. And I mean, and you got to remember, there are you know, there's lots of things out there that that can be considered risk factors. I mean, I don't think cell phones are gonna give you a brain tumor, all right. Um, you know, but but you gotta you gotta be careful too because a lot of these people that that, that, that think like that, I mean, they, they present they, they they present almost anything like it's a risk factor. I mean, I'm surprised passing gas hasn't become a risk factor yet or causing or, or into causing cancer, which good thing it's not because I would have been dead many years ago, but. Um, but you get the picture here. So risk factors increase the odds. They don't guarantee, but they can increase the odds. All right, because I've known many people who have been just heavy smokers all of their life and have relatively healthy lungs. All right, and you, you hear stories about people that develop, you know, lung lung cancer, you know, lung to, you know tumors in their lungs that have never touched a cigarette in their life. All right, so that's something you have to keep in mind. All right. So that was pretty heavy on the information side. So now let's kind of transition into talking about uh, the differences between benign and malignant tumors. And then we'll talk a little bit about what staging is and then show some visual examples of these. So a benign tumor, um, basically benign tumors, like I said, these are typically the less dangerous uh, when it comes to a diagnosis. But you have to remember that a benign tumor, if left untreated, um, not all of them, but many of them have the capability of becoming malignant. So that's something you have to keep in mind. So even though, even though being diagnosed with benign mass is oftentimes good news, well, good as it can get, um, it can become worse if left alone for too long. All right. Now, one of the things about a benign tumor is that they um, are full of differentiated cells. 
In a benign tumor, um, the cells are going to look a lot like the tissue that the tumor is growing within. All right, so there will be some slight differences, and you'll see some visual examples in a, in a little bit. But that's one thing you have to keep in mind, and I'll show you some examples of the malignant side of this because when you look at um, a malignant tumor, the you know the there's a lot of different ways you can say this. Um, for example, you can say uh, the, the malignant tumors contain poorly differentiated cells, undifferentiated cells. Oftentimes, uh, you know, or sometimes you hear the cells being described as alien in appearance, looking very foreign. They just don't look anything like the tissue they originated in. But you get the concept. The, you know, basically, cells in benign tumors look relatively normal. Um, they're just growing out of control. Whereas with cells in malignant tumors, they, they, they not only grow out of control, they look really bizarre. All right. Um, another thing with benign tumors is that they have very slow growth rates. All right, very slow growth rates. Now, how slow they are is obviously going to depend on the tissue of origin. All right, the tissue of origin. All right, um, whereas with malignant tumors, these are very metabolically demanding. These are cells that are, that are dividing out of control. Malignant tumors grow out of control. All right, they grow out of control. That's why early detection and early treatment is key when people are diagnosed with malignant tumors, all right, malignant neoplasms, all right, because if you leave them alone for too long, there are some can there are some you know cancers out there. Because remember, remember the word cancer is is associated with malignancies, all right. Um, there are certain cancers out there that within a week you could lower like small cell lung cancer. I mean, the, the longer you leave that alone, I mean, within weeks you'll be dead, all right. So that's something, you know, from the initial diagnosis. So that's something you have to keep in mind. Now, another thing that I wanted to mention as well is this capsulated versus uh, encapsulated versus unencapsulated. What, I, what I'm saying here, basically what I'm saying here is that with benign tumors, they're growing within the organ, but they're still obeying the borders of the organ. All right, they're still obeying the borders of the organ. So if you look at, this is supposed to be a liver, sorry. Again, there's a reason why I study biology and not art. Um, so if someone's developing a, a benign tumor in their liver, what you're going to see, all right, so let's say this right here is the tumor. All right, if someone's developing a benign tumor in their liver, um, obviously that's bad news because you have cells that are growing out of control, all right, that's not supposed to be there, but the tumor itself is still remaining within the borders of the liver. So basically what a benign tumor does is it causes the organ that it's originating in to expand. All right, it's going to cause it it's going to cause it to expand outward. And this is also what makes benign tumors harmful. All right? Benign tumors are non-invasive. Benign tumors are not going to grow through and into other tissues. They're not going to directly invade. But what they can do is they can cause, uh, you know, for example, visceral stretching. Okay. Remember, when you see the word visceral, viscera, you think internal organs. All right. So they can cause this. So they're going to cause visceral stretching. Obviously, the more you leave it alone, the more that organ's going to stretch. Now, let's say you've got an artery nearby. All right. Now, all of a sudden, that, that benign mass is now pressing against an artery and occluding blood flow to wherever you know that that artery is carrying blood to let's say that benign mass is pressing on a nerve all right so you're going to have um you know some neurological problems that's what makes benign tumors dangerous all right is when they cause organ ex you know visceral expansion like this the you know this organ is going to you know, is going to press on and put pressure on surrounding tissues and and damage them that way all right so benign tumors um are non-invasive they do not metastasize. They do that. They they do their deed by putting pressure on surrounding tissues. All right. Whereas with malignant you know, neoplasms or malignant tumors or malignant cancers, you notice how those terms are used, being used interchangeably like that. All right. So basically, these are capable of metastasizing. These are invasive. All right. That's bad. All right. So basically, with the malignant tumor, what you're going to have is you're going to start out with what's called a primary tumor. Okay, 
primary tumor. So for example, uh, let's think of, um, I don't know, testicular cancer. All right, so a male is developing testicular cancer and it's left untreated. Um, testicular cancer often metastasizes uh, very common sites in general for tumors that metastasize to or areas like your liver, your lungs, your brain, typically areas where there's a, you know, uh, excuse me, a lot of blood flow, a lot of circulation into there. You know, your liver has those large sinusoid capillaries in there, so it's easy for large objects to get into the liver. Okay, so... Um, so a malignant tumor is going to start out as a primary tumor. So, so with testicular cancer, it, you're going to have a primary tumor in the testes. And then if it metastasizes, basically what we're saying here are these, these high growing undifferentiated cells of the, of this malignant neoplasm are going to break off and they're going to spread. All right. So basically what they're going to do is they're going to, they're either going to metastasize, they're going to get into the bloodstream and then get circulated around the body or they're going to get into the lymphatic system and you know that your lymphatic system eventually drains into the subclavian veins and basically those tumors are going to get into the blood um, through that route. All right, but regardless, um, that's essentially how these malignant tumors uh, move themselves around. Now, wherever these, these cells that are, that are metastasizing, eventually they're going to deposit themselves in other areas. All right, so for example, if you do a, let's say someone has advanced testicular cancer, you do a chest x-ray and you see these, all these tumors developing in their chest, you would call these secondary tumors. Okay, secondary tumors. So primary because the, the, the tumor, the, the malignant neoplasm originated in the testes and then it branched out, you know, through whether it's through the lymphatic system or the circulatory system, cells escape that primary tumor and then they got circulated to another site in the body where they, where they implanted themselves and then are continuing to grow. And that's what secondary tumors are. And that is basically the invasive nature of that. Now, one of the things that these that these in, that these cells do once they implant and grow, oftentimes, you see, remember these, remember malignant, um, you know, tumors, malignant cancer cells have high growth rates. That means they have high metabolisms. All right, so they're very demanding. So one of the things they're going to do is they're going to try to basically, literally, steal blood and nutrients from you know your your not just your surrounding tissues but from your body and one of the ways they do that is they secrete what are called angiogenesis growth factors remember angio meaning vessel genesis to create all right and basically they're going to literally steal blood and nutrients from your own body and then that's going to you know, that's going to basically feed the, the cancer cells and you can do the math on how dangerous that is. And I'll, I'll focus on that more in the next video when I talk about the signs of, you know, the signs and symptoms of, of cancer. But that's something, that's another way that malignant cancer cells behave is they stimulate new blood vessel growth so they can literally feed themselves. Now, this term here, carcinoma in situ. First off, when you see the word carcinoma, Basically, what we're saying here, this is a tumor of epithelial origin. Origin, I'm sorry. Epithelial origin. So remember, a sarcoma, mesenchymal, you know, connective tissue origin. When we say carcinoma, basically, this is an, an epithelial tumor. Now, obviously, this is not good news because, as you know, epithelial cells, epithelial tissues have high turnover rates, all right? You, you're, you're constantly turning over your you know, cells of your epithelial tissues all the time. So tumors that originate in here have a high probability of you know, growing, metastasizing if left untreated or caught too late, all right? Now, not every cancer, not every malignant tumor just automatically starts spreading right away. So typically what you're gonna see first is you're gonna like, with, like for example, like with a malignant melanoma, all right? You know, if you do a if you do a biopsy of a mole or take a look at the skin, you're gonna see it. You're gonna see the area where the melanoma is developing. So basically, you're gonna see an area of that skin where there's a lot of bizarre, abnormal-looking cells. All right, but they haven't started to spread yet. That's good news. All right, that means this is a lot more treatable. All right, so carcinoma in situ. Basically, what we're saying here is that we have all these alien-looking cells that have developed this neoplasm that have developed into this malignant tumor in this area but they haven't started spreading yet in situ, in sight, in place. All right, so all these cancer cells are in place and haven't started spreading yet. 
And then, but if you, and then obviously once they start to metastasize and move around, then that's when this basically goes out the window. Because for example, like when a malignant melanoma, when it metastasizes and it gets into the lymph nodes, um, remember melanin, melanoma, remember melanin is a very black, you know, in its purest form is a very black pigment. Um, and if it gets into the, basically if it gets into lymph nodes, for example, it's going to be very easy to spot because you're going to see all these very dark areas where these, um, you know, these, these melanocytes and these pigment cells are, are kind of uh, aggregating and developing from there. All right, so, so carcinoma in situ. It's a malignant neoplasm that has not started to metastasize and invade yet. All right, again, when you do a biopsy and look at this area, it's noticeable that there is a malignant neoplasm there. It just hasn't started branching out yet. Okay. Now, another thing that's important to focus on when it comes to tumors and cancer, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this, but, um, but this is important to understand as, a, as an aspiring healthcare professional, is what's called staging of cancer. Basically, what, and, and I, I, the vast majority of you that are watching this video or the, the, that, uh, or that are learning about this, I guarantee you've all heard of this at some point, whoops, at some point in time anyway. Like uh, you've heard about someone who's diagnosed with a, you know, a stage one tumor or a stage three tumor. All right. Um, so basically what staging is, staging is basically when you compile information about that neoplasm so you can develop a prognosis um, uh, for that patient. And remember, prognosis. Prognosis is basically projected outcome. All right. And part of that projected outcome is trying to figure out, okay, what's the treatment going to be? All right. So once you gather information about that neoplasm, about that tumor, and you know, you look at is it differentiated and undifferentiated cells? Is it a carcinoma in situ? Is it a sarcoma? Whatever it may be. All right, then that's obviously going to help you determine the treatment. And then once you figure out, once you basically diagnose what type of neoplasm it is and you figure out how you're going to treat it, then you can get a prognosis and you can project the outcomes for that patient. Obviously, the earlier you catch it, the better the prognosis. Now, again, I want to emphasize on this. A prognosis is very similar to risk factors in that, and there's a reason why I'm calling this projected outcomes and not a cure. All right, projected outcomes. I'm saying here that you're figuring out the best road to, to wander down. But again, a prognosis is not a guarantee. It's a route you're going to travel to help treat that patient with. All right. You have to remember in medicine, you do not give out guarantees to patients. Do not do that. All right. That's a great way to instill, even in the most minor trivial situations, because that's a great way to instill false hope. And that's a great way to get your pants suit off if something goes wrong. All right. So just give patients the information. Um, you know, give them the prognosis, give them the outcomes, and then you work from there. Okay. Now, basically, when you're thinking of the staging of a tumor, um, you know, the staging of a neoplasm, there's, you know, you have to think about the the, the major factors you have to think about are um, the size of the tumor. All right, the size of the tumor. Um, is there nodal involvement, and is there metastasis? All right, is this thing metastasizing? All right, um, so basically, you know, TNM, tumor, you know, is there a presence of a tumor? All right, nodal involvement, N for nodal, M for metastasis. All right, so basically there are four stages that are involved in staging of cancers, or, or neoplasms, I'm sorry. One, two, three, and four. And this particular site here, I put this on here because this is the uh, kind of the United States, um, uh, the... Cancer Institute that has all these major facts, um, this this public these public information, these facts when involved that are involved with diagnosing tumors in the first place. All right, so obviously stage one is the best news that you can possibly get when it comes to a neoplasm. No lymph nodes involved. All right, no metastasis, and the tumor is under two centimeters. Now. For most of my users around the planet, uh, this will make sense. For us Americans who are, for some reason, not using the metric system, um, remember that one inch equals 2.5 centimeters. So basically, this is a tumor or a neoplasm that is under an inch in size, an inch in diameter. Okay? So no lymph node involvement and no metastasis. Now, these middle stages here, two and three, basically, if someone is diagnosed with a stage two tumor, what we're saying here is that there's local node involvement, there's still no metastasis occurring, 
and basically the tumor is under five centimeters in diameter. All right, so if you do this, so basically what we're saying here is that this is under two inches in diameter. All right, if we're thinking of stage three, um, basically what we're saying here is that there's nodal involvement. So basically it's spread to nodes outside of the local area. So for example, if we're thinking like with a stage two, let's uh, like a, uh, like a, um, uh, breast cancer. Someone develops a, a, a you know tumor in the breast. There's a lot of lymph nodes in the in the mammary area, um, and basically, if you catch a tumor early enough, uh, basically, um, you know, if, like a stage two um, breast cancer, basically, it wouldn't it it's still going to be localized within the mammary tissue. It's going to be under five centimeters, and it's only moved worked its way into the lymph nodes within the mammary area or the breast. All right, it hasn't metastasized into um, like your inguinal lymph nodes or your cervical lymph nodes, and so on. All right. Um, whereas with a, a stage three, um, the big factor with this is the size. All right. So basically, yeah, there's more there's more nodal involvement. Um, it's going to be good potentially be a little more than local. But the big thing here is that it's bigger than two inches, all right? And it still hasn't metastasized yet, but obviously now it's getting closer to developing into that cancerous stage. So basically when someone is diagnosed with a stage four cancer, now we have massive nodal involvement. Um, it is metastasizing and it's greater than, you know, five inch, you know, five centimeters, five inches, five centimeters, okay? Um, so basically when someone is diagnosed with a stage four uh, cancer stage four tumor, um, you're dealing with primary and secondary tumors. You notice with these first three, you're still only dealing with primary. Um, you're, you're basically dealing with primary tumors. Okay. And like I said, I would, re I would highly recommend going to this website because there's a lot of very good and down to earth information regarding everything I've been talking about here. All right. So that's enough words for you. Let's take a look at some images related to this. Um, so the first two images we're going to look at are examples of benign tumors. So this is what a normal liver looks like. All right. So typically with, um, when we have blood flow into the liver, this is going to be, I have to use a different color than red here. And color, let's go with, uh, St. Patrick's Day is coming up. So let's go with green. Okay. So basically when you look at uh, and when you look at how the liver is organized, um, Basically, what you have here is you've got these central veins and then these sinusoid capillaries branching out. All right. Then you've got hepatocytes. Um, you know, there's Kupfer cells kind of right next to these capillaries. All right. But basically, that's how essentially how the liver is organized. And then kind of branching out from here are going to be, um, you know, lymphatics or, you know, lymphatics and so on. All right. But, but. You know, that, that's basically, you know, a liver in a nutshell. I mean, it's, it's kind of a boring organ to look at um, just because, remember, hepatocytes are um, are those stable cells. Liver cells don't divide unless they have to. So they're kind of in a constant state of, of uh, you know, gap zero unless they need to divide. All right, whereas here, um, you know, someone develops a hepatocellular adenoma. This is a, a, a benign tumor that can develop, for example, um, in some cases with... Um, uh, estrogen treatments or like for example uh, it's kind of one of the risk factors of certain birth control medications and so on all right but here uh, a hepatocellular adenoma so you can clearly see the tumor all right you can clearly see the abnormal tissue in this area now does it really look a whole lot different no I mean if you were to look at this in a, in a higher magnification the hepatocytes would look very similar they're gonna look a little off all right but basically what you have here are these cells they're just growing out of control all right, they're disobeying the laws of that organ because you have to remember, I mean, organs kind of have this inherent size to them. You know, your heart, your liver, your stomach. All right, and basically, once all the once all the space is filled within the organ, all right, that's it, it's that's it. There's no need for cells to divide. So in this benign mass here, the, it, these cells are disobeying those um, you know those kind of innate mechanisms. And, and and growing and causing you know the expanding nature of that you know of the liver in this situation, 
All right. So basically, that 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 kind of innate nature of obeying borders is what's called contact inhibition. All right. When all the space is filled, when all the cells are contacting each other, they don't divide. So that by them contacting each other, that's what contact inhibition is. All right. So obviously, this you know this this area of the liver is not obeying that, and a benign mass is developing. Okay. Now, typically, now this is something that can be that can be treated with surgery, radiation. All right. Um, you know, depending on you know the the how deep the tumor is, where it's at, and so on. But you get the picture here because you can look at this. The the, the point I'm trying to make here um, is that this tissue looks very similar to the tissue of origin. Obviously, some different characteristics, but you you get the picture. Um, this is an example of the parathyroid gland, um, a parathyroid adenoma um, on the right here. I mean, these two all. I mean, these two almost look like identical snapshots of one another. All right, um, but one of the big differences that you see here. Remember, what do these white ping pong ball looking cells look like? Remember, those are adipocytes. Those are fat cells. All right, and one of the things that you'll notice here is that with these parathyroid adenomas, there's typically less fat. Um, kind of in the in the spaces or areas of the you know the parathyroid glands, which I mean should make sense because these cells are growing out of control. They're a little more metabolically um, demanding. All right, they're going to use up more energy in the area. All right, but basically there's only it's hard to tell the difference between between these two. Um, you know, without doing some very in depth histology and and learning about this. All right, but. Um, you know, another thing you're going to see, you know, increase, you know, fibers developing in the area as these cells grow and, and so on. But basically with this parathyroid um, adenoma, I mean, the parathyroid glands are going to enlarge, right? In the, in the, in the previous example that we looked at with the hepatocellular adenoma, um, the liver is going to enlarge. And that's a big reason why, you know, if, if somebody dies and, you, and an autopsy is done on them, that's why they weigh the organs because typically organs have a certain weight to them. But if all of a sudden the liver is a you know a pound heavier than it should be, then well then that'll obviously lead the the pathologist to investigate further. All right. Um, now something you have to remember about adenomas as well, um, whether they're malignant or benign. In many cases, this can be a little goofy. Um, I'll talk about this more in the next presentation. But oftentimes tumors that develop from glandular tissue often secrete hormones, right? And, and hormones in excess. We kind of obey the laws of negative feedback. Now, when this happens, this can create what's called perineal plastic syndrome. All right. So basically, if someone is is pumping out high levels of a particular hormone, you're going to see the the clinical manifestation stations are going to be the effects of that hormone. Now I say that, I'll talk about that more in depth later on, not in this video, but the next one. I'm saying that because let's say someone is developing a, uh, an insulinoma, all right, uh, uh, a tumor that's that's secreting insulin. That person is going to be very hypoglycemic. They're going to have low blood sugar levels. In this situation, this person may crank out excessive amounts of parathyroid hormone, all right, and make them hypercalcemic. All right. Um, so basically, what's gonna this could throw off the initial diagnosis because well, the, the physicians are gonna figure out why the, what's making them to be what's making them um, hypercalcemic, why their blood sugar levels really low in certain lung cancers. Some people throw out um, excessive uh, ACTH and crank out and 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 create what's called Cushing's syndrome. All right. So that's something you have to keep in mind with that is that oftentimes the you know these can throw off the diagnosis but again you get the concept sorry for that side rail again there but you get the you get the picture here that with benign neo that with benign neoplasms benign tumors they look almost exactly like the tissues they originate from and they just cause expansion of that tissue whereas with malignant tumors this is a pap smear from a postmenopausal female all right um, basically when you look at these epithelial cells um, of a pap smear epithelial cells especially squamous cells are the most boring cells to look at they're flat there's nothing to them all right i don't think you need me to sit here and explain that this is a little off all right this image here so basically these cells are very alien in appearance these look these are these are those undifferentiated under that undifferentiated cells that I was talking about. All right. So, um, so basically this is going to throw, throw a red flag, um, throw up a red flag and you're going to have to go from there. And then obviously then you have to figure out, okay, well we have to do staging now. All right. What's the size of this? 
um, has it metastasized? Has it worked its way into lymph nodes? If so, are the, is it just local nodes or further? Um, if it's metastasizing, now we have to deal with a, a primary and secondary tumor. So this would be an example of a primary tumor that's developing, you know, from uh, you know the cervix. Okay, um, but you get the picture here. I mean, you, 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 like I said, this doesn't warrant a lot of explanation that this looks a lot different with um, the lungs. All right, we've with uh, lung cancer. So basically, this isn't a, a picture of a normal lung. All right, because basically from here on over, this is an example of emphysema. So basically with emphysema, people have obstructed airways. They have these mucus plugs that plug their bronchioles. Then they have uh, hyperinflated alveolar air sacs, which is what you're seeing here. So you see these big spaces that are just, that are filled. And, and that's why people with emphysema have an increased residual volume. You know, they have, they have too much air left in their lungs. All right, but here on the right, this is a relatively unaffected area of lung tissue. All right, remember, alveolar air sacs are just simple squamous epithelial cells, um, and then surrounding them would be capillaries, and then separating the capillaries and the alveolar air sacs would be the basement membranes of the endothelial and squamous cells. All right, um, but this is what normal lung tissue looks like. Again, you take a look at this. This is a small cell carcinoma, the probably the most, well, probably the most aggressive form of lung cancer a person can get. Uh, bad news. Now remember, carcinoma. Carcinoma. Remember, what are we saying here when we're saying carcinoma? This is this is a tumor or a neoplasm of epithelial origin. Origin. And remember, the lungs are predominantly made of, or the the in the internal aspects of the lungs are predominantly epithelial tissue. These alveolar air sacs. Now, this is obviously not normal here. All right. Basically, with small cell lung cancer, you develop a, you know the, you have these small cells that grow at incredibly rapid rates that secrete these various proteins that have these highly condensed nuclei. All right, and that's what you're looking at here is this all these these rapidly growing condensed cells. All right, and like I said, this grows at a very rapid rate. But you can see the difference, you know, from you know from the normal lung to the cancerous lung over here. All right, so hopefully these images illustrated the point of, um, you know, benign tumors pretty much looking like the tissue that they came from, whereas malignant tumors are very um, alien, bizarre in appearance. And then that's where, you know, like I said, when, you, when one of these are found, whether it's benign or malignant, that's where staging is very necessary so you can figure out the appropriate treatment. All right, so that is kind of my overview of the, just like I said, basic overview of, of neoplasms, uh, tumors, cancer, what, what this is all about. Remember all that, that, that very uh, uh, introductory but important terminology related to this because that's stuff you're going to see all the time. All right, and then, um, oh, and I forgot one more thing. I forgot I had an image of carcinoma in situ. All right, so again, carcinoma epithelial. So this is an example of, um, you know, endo, an endocervical tumor here. Um, so basically you can look at this. It, it's pretty obvious where the tumor is. Now, you'll see here that these cells are very alien. They're very bizarre. They look nothing like the cells in the environment that's surrounding them. All right. This, this is a brand new weird tissue growth. All right. This is a malignant neoplasm, but it, uh, um, but it hasn't started to spread yet. All right, so you can see how these are how this malignant neoplasm is still localized to the area. All right, so remember carcinoma in situ. It has not started to undergo um, you know metastasis yet. All right, it has not metastasized. Now, like I said, a malignant neoplasm you obviously is not good news. But this is if if there's any news you want to get related to that, this is it because. Then you can obviously, if you catch this before it spreads, obviously the prognosis is hopefully going to be much better. Okay, so that's an example of carcinoma in situ. My apologies for forgetting that. And then these are the images that I used in this presentation. All right, so that is my introduction to cancer. Um, like I said, clinical signs are coming up next.